Okay, good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here this morning on this cold, brisk air. <laughs> okay, here we are. <laughs> good morning, thanks. Um, this morning we're here with Kate Hampton. She's the Community Preservation Officer at the Montana Historical Society State Historic Preservation Office where she works directly with local community preservation programs to document and preserve their cultural resources. Her past work includes several years with the Montana Preservation Alliance as the director of the Most Endangered Pla Places Program, coordinating Montana's National Register of Historic Places Program, and working throughout the West as a research historian with Historic Research Associates Incorporated. Please welcome Kate Hampton. Hi. Make sure this works. Now, can, can you hear me? This is so weird. OK, I'm good. I'll get used to it. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here and talk to you about Montana's Carnegie Libraries. And first off, I'd like to thank the friends for inviting me. Um, to this wonderful, you know, we love coming here to the Boo Auditorium. It's one of our favorite places. And thanks to the Montana History Foundation, especially Charlene Porcelain <coughs> in the front row, <laughs> who brought this wonderful idea to fruition, not only to celebrate our state's Carnegie libraries, but also to publish a book about them, the proceeds of which will go to be used, used for their support and maintenance. Penelope Wilson, who's that nice lady up in the upper left <laughs> corner, um, there with Charlene, uh, came up with the idea, and um, whose dedication to the Big Timber Library and generous donation initiated the project, and to the Donnelly Foundation and all of the individual donors who supported and continue to support our precious libraries. To Dr. Mary Greenfield, who's in the lower right there, who braved New York snow and cold to research the Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation archives at Columbia University. She traveled back and forth from her home in uh, Brooklyn and copied every single piece of correspondence between Montana and the Carnegie Corporation for all 17 libraries and provided all of that research to us. And now we have hard copies that we can share with all of the Carnegie libraries in the state. So we're very grateful to her, to our dear, hilarious Mr. Tom Ferris, whose spectacular photos and infectious sense of humor made this book a pure joy. And to Becca Cole, our wonderful Becca Cole, uh, whose encyclopedic knowledge of uh, the Historical Society's photo archives was invaluable. A big shout out to the Montana State Library. I found that it's really important to thank people because if you thank people, then they want to hire you again or give you more money. 
Montana State Library and librarian staff at each of these wonderful public libraries. Past and present, they and many women's clubs members who supported them are the real story here. Their enthusiasm, guidance, and endless expertise are truly worthy of celebrating. It's a wonderful idea, and I'm so happy to have been part, asked to contribute to such a great project. So I always have to start everything with a acknowledgement, and that is that I am not from Montana. I know, there's always a big sigh and people are really disappointed. Um, <laughs> I have lived here longer now than I have lived, I lived, I grew up in Baltimore actually. Um, but now I've lived in Montana longer than I ever lived in Baltimore, so that gives me some credence. Um, but I did grow up in Baltimore, specifically in Towson on the north side of the city. And my local library was a modern affair, constructed in 1974, this is a picture of it, when I was five years old. A hulking, stark, brutalist building on a busy street. There was always an adventure to go there with my siblings, so I'm the fourth of five kids, so my mom would pile us all into the station wagon to go to the library every week. It was just a huge adventure, not so much because of the books, or even the interior space, which was kind of intimidating. You can see in the picture there, it was just a big open space and always busy and crowded. But the best part was to get into the library, you had to go up this three-story circular ramp that went all the way up, and all five of us would just run up and down and up and down that ramp for hours while my mom was very frustrated carrying a load of books and yelling at us. So that was my first library experience. Um, but in Baltimore, we have a wonderful library system um, founded by a man named Enoch Pratt. And he funded Baltimore City Public Library System beginning in 1882. The main branch opened in 1886, and that's this building here. When I was in college and living in the city, I loved to go to the Pratt Main Library and realized how building's architecture could influence how I felt about going to the library. You know, now that I'm an architectural historian, I really do like brutalism, and I've come to love the Towson Library, but man, this is just beautiful. There I felt welcome and warm. I could find a nook to read by natural light and scour stacks endlessly. I felt privileged to be there. Andrew Carnegie admired Ian you know, Pratt's legacy in Baltimore, and even referred to it as a model for others in his important 1889 essay, The Gospel of Wealth. He said... Many free libraries have been established in our country, but none that I know of with such wisdom as the Pratt Library in Baltimore. Mr. Pratt presented the city of Baltimore $1 million, requiring it to pay 5% per annum, amounting to $50,000 per year, which is to be devoted to the maintenance and development of the library and its branches. Mr. Pratt has done more for the genuine progress of the people that has been done by all the contributions of all the millionaires and rich people to help those who cannot help themselves. One wise administrator of his surplus has poured his fertilizing stream upon the soil, you know, it was the late 19th century, they are romantic, and was ready to receive it and return a hundredfold. In 1906, the Carnegie Corporation gifted $500,000 to the Pratt Library to build 20 new library branches. By 1906, that same year, Montana already boasted seven Carnegie libraries. Rather than requiring a 5% gift amount for maintenance, Carnegie required 10%. So to receive, say, $10,000 for a building, a city like Lewistown would have to agree to provide at least $1,000 per year in perpetuity for conditions and maintenance. Between 1901 and 1922, 17 Montana communities received gifts from the wealthiest man in the world, Andrew Carnegie, and it is Carnegie, not Carnegie, and I grew up in, you know, everybody says Carnegie because you think Carnegie Hall, you think all that sort of stuff, and my dear friend growing up was from Pittsburgh, which is, you know, Carnegie's town, and we would have endless arguments. I'd be yelling at her saying, it's Carnegie for crying out loud, and of course, I had to acknowledge that she was right. Um, so if I say, so if I flip back and forth between Carnegie and Carnegie, it's, it's just me not being able to speak clearly, sorry. The 15 libraries that remain standing in Montana are important touchstones for their communities. The 17 built are, and i sorry, I usually have a slide, I don't have a slide with all of them, but I'll list them for you because it's always a question. So here we go, they are Dillon, Mile City, Great Falls, Bozeman, Kalispell, Missoula, Livingston, Lewistown, 
Glasgow, Big Timber, Haver, Hamilton, Malta, Fort Benton, Hardin, Red Lodge, and Chinook, which is Blaine County Library. A little bit about Andrew himself. He was an interesting character. He was certainly no saint, but he did try to justify his ardent capitalism through the philosophy of social Darwinism. It seems to me that he would have had to work, to justif work hard to justify his actions and the actions of his management team to his family. His father, William Carnegie, was a skilled damask linen handloom weaver in Scotland before it, the introduction of mechanized weaving machines. And he, was in, he managed to establish a middle class life for his family. But the Industrial Revolution pushed the skilled laborer out of work. The senior Carnegie was a leader among other craftsmen in the Charterist movement, a working class reform movement in Britain. As the family fell into poverty, Carnegie's mother took in odd jobs, and in 1848, the family borrowed money to move to a Scottish enclave in Allegheny City, which is now part of Pittsburgh. Thirteen-year-old Andrew Carnegie found employment in a cotton factory, first as a bobbin boy and then as an engineer's assistant, responsible for stoking the boilers and running the engine in the cellar for 12 hours a day, six days a week. On Saturdays, he found respite and inspiration at a local private library. Businessman and iron manufacturer Colonel James Anderson offered his collection of 400 books to working boys to use. Notice it's always working boys, never girls. And this generosity had a lasting impact on Carnegie. And actually, if you go to um, Pittsburgh, which is a great city, um, most of Carnegie-related places are no longer standing. The mill where uh, he worked with his fa family, uh, and even the house where he lived when he was a working uh, boy, now is in the place where the new stadium has been built at, at Pittsburgh. So you can uh, you know, revere Andrew Carnegie while watching a game. Um, one of the buildings that is still standing is the house that housed this private library, which was his inspiration for his uh, work. And that's Mr. Anderson up there in the corner. Um, and this building is actually still used. There's still a library in it, um, but it's a, a convalescent care home and uh, a retirement home. So you can still visit it and you can still say hello. Um, but it's one of the few places in Pittsburgh directly associated with the early life of Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie worked hard and became a superintendent of the Pennsylvania Railroad by his early 20s and invested his money wisely in material and industry. He turned to the steel industry in the 1870s, and by 1892, his Carnegie Steel Company was one of the most influential and successful enterprises in the world. His younger brother, Thomas, was an important part of his management team and actually gained quite a bit of wealth himself, um, whereas Carne Andrew Carnegie wanted to give all his money away. I think he kind of felt guilty, you know, because his father was such a unionist, and here he was breaking up unions, so he, there, was, there was a lot of guilt there. Um, Thomas, however, had no guilt. He was very happy to have all of this money, and um, you know, he had a private island, and he had all kinds of stuff. Uh, well into the 20th century. So while direct descendants of Andrew Carnegie didn't inherit that much, direct descendants of Thomas Carnegie fared a little bit better. <clears throat> anyway, Carnegie believed that the rich had a responsibility to give away their wealth in a way that promoted, quote, real and permanent good in the world and helped people help themselves. His visit to the library is at Colonel Anderson's house as a youth influenced his decision to fund libraries. He determined that a library constituted, quote, the best gift to give to a community. He explained his philosophy in two articles printed in the North American Review in 1889, and together they were reprinted as the gospel of wealth. In it, he acknowledged the rift between rich and poor, but determined that it was necessary that fruitful competition between the economically powerful not only increased the upper class's wealth, but also raised the fortunes of the working class. So, chuckle down economics, 19th century style. He wrote, the law of competition may be sometimes hard for the individual, but it is best for the race because it ensures the survival of the fittest in every department. We accept and welcome, therefore, the concentration of business, industrial, and commercial in the hands of a few, 
and the law of competition between these as being not only beneficial, but essential for the future progress of the race. Carnegie believed that the wealthy were those with a special talent for organization and management, working in a free capitalistic society, and that their inevitable accumulation of wealth was good for everybody. Yeah, that's, sure you'd think that. He also argued that those blessed with these talents had the responsibility to thoughtfully give their wealth away within their lifetimes. He did not believe in simply giving money to the poor, but instead to give to causes that would help the wealthy poor, or I'm sorry, not the wealthy poor, there's no such thing, the worthy poor, and he always said the worthy poor, improve themselves. Again, he wrote, the man of wealth thus becoming a mere agent and trustee for his poor brethren, bringing to their service his superior wisdom, experience, and ability to administer, doing for them better than they would or could do for themselves. So that was his philosophy. By the time he wrote The Gospel of Wealth, Carnegie had already determined that libraries were the ideal venue for giving. In 1883, he funded construction of a free public library in his birthplace in Scotland. Next, he funded libraries in southwest Pennsylvania, the place where he earned his fortune. Expanding his sphere of generosity, he began to fund additional locales in 1898. Over the next 24 years, just six states, Indiana, California, Ohio, New York, Illinois, and Iowa accounted for more than one-third of the 1,689 Carnegie-funded libraries across the country. And I can't really figure out why, except that I think that they really liked the program and they just asked for more money and more, more libraries. There was no kind of rhyme or reason to it. Um, it's not, I don't think, any particular reason that Carnegie or his staff liked these particular states individually, I think that they just kept asking and he kept giving. Montana's 17 Carnegie gifts were about average for the remaining states and territories. At first, the process was simple. A com community wrote to Andrew Carnegie and requested money to build a library. The inquiry needed only to state the town's population, a commitment to securing building lots, and a promise to pay to maintain the library into the future. Carnegie routinely gave at least $2 per resident per, for construction and often more. Few specific architectural requirements accompanied the funding. In Montana, eight Carnegie libraries completed between 1902 and 1907 reflected this relative freedom of design. Dillon in the upper left-hand corner and Lewistown, I love Lewistown, 1907, um, both incorporated exuberant stone edifices featuring local materials and craftsmanship. And I just love, people ask, all the, which is your favorite? And it's like your children, you can't really pick your favorite, but you kind of have one. And I really, I love the Dillon Library. It's just spectacular. Um, it's like a little church. It's very similar in design, actually, to the Western, what's now the Western Heritage Center, the original um, library, Parmley Billings Library in Billings. And in fact, the architect, Charles Hare, who designed it, um, had just finished the Parmley Library in Billings, and I think he kind of brought a lot of that aesthetic sensibility with him to Dillon. It also helped that the people that really were the go-getters in trying to secure this library funding was um, a reverend and his wife. So it does look like a little church, and it's the only one with a turret. Um, and the interior is just as spectacular as the exterior, if you've ever been in. If you haven't, it's worth a trip. Um, and then the Lewistown Library is so great. Um, of course, Lewistown is famous for its wonderful sandstone buildings. Um, and the Croatian stonemasons that built up that community through the late 19th and early 20th century. The Tuss brothers were the contractors on this particular building, um, and they bid it out. They only had $10,000. They had a $10,000 gift from Carnegie to construct it. Um, they brought in all their local laborers. Every stone is hand cut. The brackets underneath the, that are supporting the roof are actually sto carved stone. Um, it's just spectacular. In the end, the bill was $14,000. And the Tusk brothers said, we'll take $10,000. We wanted to build the best building that we could in the most beautiful building. We had a vision for it, and we're donating that extra $4,000 to the community. So that's a really, I love that one. Architect Charles Hare's monumental designs for Miles City Great Falls, but 
and Bozeman, along with George Shanley's drawings for Kalispell, embraced high style elements including domes, stone columns, deep dentaled overhangs, and highly decorative cornices. So Mile City's up in the upper left, uh, upper right is Kalispell, we have Bozeman lower left, and then this is the floor plan for the Great Falls um, design in Great Falls, which was constructed in 1903. And then we have Missoula and Livingston are both neoclassical revival style libraries that included grandly scaled entries and windows. Um, of course, the Missoula Carnegie Library is now the Art Center. It's no longer their public library. It closed in the early 70s, I believe, um, but almost immediately became the, the Art Center. Um, but Livingston Public Library still is uh, housed in the original Carnegie building, and plus a couple of additions that went on the back. <clears throat> By 1906, Andrew Carnegie's library program and his other charitable projects consumed so much of his time that he turned increasingly to his longtime personal secretary, James Bertram, to handle the details of the program. Bertram created a stricter stretch of procedures for the applicants with specific language for communities to use when establishing their local library funds and accepting the gift. He's a shy guy. This is actually the only picture I can find of him, um, you know, in this kind of group photo. And by the time the library program was in full swing, basically he went into his office in the morning, didn't talk to anybody, kept his head down as he walked on the sidewalk to catch the train home because he was just terrified of seeing people because he assumed they were going to ask him for money. And it was kind of just a sad little existence. And there is a story of him walking down the street and somebody chasing after him and stopping him. And he was just so nervous and he didn't want to talk to him. And he said, I'm from this particular town. You know, I just wanted to talk to you about a library. And he's like, oh, you know, please go away. And the man said, no, I just wanted to thank you for this wonderful library. And he looked up and smiled, and like they went to lunch together. He was so relieved that he had a gentleman that was actually not asking for more money. Um, people in Montana kept asking for money. Um, Bertram also created library guidelines for design that favored a simpler yet dignified construction and emphasized usable space and efficiency. Looking for guidance from professional librarians rather than architects, he really didn't like architects. He didn't want to talk to an architect. He didn't want to correspond with an architect. No architects. He thought they were just wanted to design for their own glory, not for the practical uses of a library. Um, and so he really was a great believer in the professional librarian uh, genre. And he, you know, he really respected their opinions far over the architects. He demanded efficient designs, like librarians do, uh, that focused less on ornamentation and more on the practical business of the library. These buildings were dignified and inviting, but not ostentatious. In 1911, Carnegie formed the Carnegie Corporation of New York to officially administer his charitable endeavors and chose Bertram as the corporation's founding secretary. That year, he began to distribute his, quote, notes on the erection of library buildings. Let me see if I've got a picture of that. Um, which offered sample floor plans for small and medium-sized libraries. Uh, the Glasgow Public Library is a good example. It's no longer standing, but it was a good example of kind of this slimmed down design toward Glasgow. Um, but if you look at the, the actual floor plans that he provided, you'll see that it says, notes on the erection of library buildings, spelled B-I-L-D, NGS, and that's not a typo on my part. Um, I told you, Carnegie was a strange guy, and he really got angry about the littlest things like the overuse of vowels and consonants in the uh, English language. And he actually sponsored, he had some congressmen sponsor a bill to change the spelling and use a different uh, a dictionary for the United States because he was tired of all these extraneous letters. And so all of his staff were required to correspond according to this dictionary that he had put together, including Bertram, which makes this correspondence, you think, my goodness, these people don't know how to spell. How are they running a corporation? Um, but in fact, that was how they were supposed to do it. He's an odd guy.
So Bertram's new guidelines required a single point of contact between himself and the community, verifiable population numbers, and draft architectural drawings for his review. They weren't to come in tubes. They were not to be attached to any kind of cardboard. They were to be folded and placed in an envelope. Um, and he was very strict about this. If it came in any kind of other form, uh, he would get very angry and say, you know, why, why aren't you following my instructions? And you can imagine why, because he's got 1,600 communities sending him plans and um, his whole room would have been full of these tubes and these cardboard pieces, so he had to be able to file them. But he was very strict. But nine Montana communities proved themselves willing and able to meet the, his requirements. Following these exacting procedures generally resulted in more correspondence and longer periods of negotiation between the corporation and the applicants. Each of the libraries in Montana's second wave displayed the architectural restraint advocated by Bertram and often necessitated the, by the cost and availability of materials. Beginning with the library in Glasgow, Montana in 1909, these Carnegie libraries featured brick veneer exteriors, centered entries set off by pilasters or columns so they're not true they don't stick out from the building, they're just hinting at being a column just by protruding just a little bit, but they're actually attached to the building. Um, they have rectangular footprints, uh, flat or hipped roofs, modest cornices, and single stories atop daylight basements, the elements that became hallmarks of the Carnegie classic architectural style. Main floors contained a central circulation desk, stacks and reading rooms, while the basements housed space for assembly or the lecture room with separate access from the main entry. Mechanical rooms and restrooms were also typically located in the basement. And these common elements make the Carnegie libraries built between 1909 and 1922 easily recognizable as they stand as important visual landmarks in their community's civic landscapes. He was really strict. And so, for example, in Bighorn County, they wanted a sink on the first floor, right by the vestibule, so that p kids coming in from Lord knows where, with jam hands all sticky and dirty, wouldn't touch the pretty, pretty books. And Bertram said, no, you know, all the plumbing goes downstairs, they can walk downstairs and they can wash their hands. And they actually had the state librarian write to Bertram <laughs> and say, no, really, these children are filthy and they need to be able to wash their hands right away. Um, and in the end, they won. And it's the only Carnegie Library, I believe, that probably has a, a sink at the first floor. <laughs> Books are heavy, they're fragile, and they take up a lot of room. So you can see why they were a relatively rare commodity in the Rocky Mountain West during the 19th century, especially before the railroads. But sometimes they serve an essential purpose. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, because this wouldn't be a talk in Montana without mentioning those two, traveled through the region and at the library of scientific tomes, reference books, a history of Louisiana, and maps essentially to their success. On May 14, 1905, Sacagawea famously saved many of the Corps' books when one of the expedition's canoes overturned in the Missouri. There she is, saving the books. Other explorers and fur traders also carried val valued volumes with them or sought them out when they came to the territory. Fort Mackenzie, near present-day Loma, boasted one of Montana's very first libraries. Between 1833 and 1844, this collection contained a little bit of everything, science, history, poetry, and fiction. In 1861, the Stuart brothers famously rode 150 miles from the Deer Lodge Valley to the Bitterroot to purchase bo books from a collection there. Two years later, John Mullen described the book collection at Fort Owen as, quote, the finest he had seen on the Pacific North Coast. Elsewhere in the United States, as elsewhere in the United States, Montana's first libraries were accessed through membership or subscriptions. One of the first publicly accessible subscription libraries opened in Helena in 1868. Wrote one Helena resident, here, again, 19th century language, here where the allurements of vice are many, and the intellectual entertainments few, where hundreds of men have leisure and little acquaintance and the gratification of their desire to read, 
is otherwise expensive, the establishment of, circula of a circulating library and the maintenance of cheerful reading rooms is fraught with manifold benefits to the entire community. They really wanted to keep men out of the bars and the brothels. That was like the main reason to have a reading room or library in most Montana cities. Fort Benton and Deer Lodge soon followed, and Bozeman called for a public library in 1972. As the population increased over the next several decades, community leaders across the territory established libraries. These institutions were often a simple room in a private home, but they offered educational opportunities in hopes that young men would find them suitable and an alternative to saloons, gambling houses, and brothels. Local residents also believed libraries might bring increased stability to their community, but really it was about the brothels. In 1883, the Montana Territorial Legislative Assembly empowered cities and towns to levy up to a one mill tax, one dollar for every thousand dollars of property value, to quote, establish and maintain one free public library for the use of its citizens. Several cities, including Helena, Butte, Dillon, Great Falls, Bozeman, and Glasgow, established libraries through taxation. Taxes paid for acquisition and maintenance, but most communities didn't have the money to construct a dedicated library building. There were exceptions. Let's look at the exceptions. <clears throat> the William H. Coors Memorial Library in Deer Lodge, which is fabulous and still used as their public library. The Hearst Free Library in Anaconda. The Butte Public Library, which is no longer standing, and the Parmley Billings Memorial Library, uh, which is now the Western Heritage Center, were all built with the infusion of funds from wealthy local benefactors. Other towns, however, housed their collections in cramped city halls or rented rooms. Dillon's library existed, quote, in a miserable wooden shack, and the Hamilton Library smelled like the livery next door. <laughs> it was funny, that's in the letter. Uh, from the ha city of Hamilton to Bertram to the Carnegie Cor Corporation saying it stinks in there because it was in their city hall and it was one of those cool city halls that also housed the firehouse and of course they needed horses to pull the carriages and the livery was right next to the library, the reading room. And so it really wasn't pleasant. By 1900, the pressing need for dedicated library buildings coincided with the rise of progressive era social organizations, a wave of new municipalities, and the availability of construction funds from Andrew Carnegie. In Montana, as in other states, women's clubs took up the task. Nationally, women's clubs had their origins in, as literary societies, and advocating for libraries was a natural extension of their mission. This was true in Montana, where formal and informal groups of women from Missoula to Miles City and numerous communities in between, including the Fort Benton Women's Club pictured here, established book collections and reading rooms. As Montana's population mushroomed, these endeavors intersected with local government's desires to establish attractive civic institutions to bolster a sense of permanence. The library program dedicated to, quote, promoting the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding among the people of the United States proved well suited to accomplishing these goals. Often women's clubs took the lead in garnering names on petitions corresponding with Carnegie and Bertram and fundraising. In Montana, the early 1910s witnessed dramatic population increases, especially in the eastern part of the state, attributable to the opening of reservation lands and non-Indian settlement, boosterism, and the passage of the Enlarged Homestead Act of 1909. The Montana Library Association, established in 1906, promoted libraries in these areas. And the 1915 county library law allowed residents to petition their county governments to levy up to two mills to maintain a library. So the 1883 law was just for cities and towns. Counties weren't allowed to have their own tax in order to keep up a library. So that didn't happen until 1915. And this woman, Gertrude Buckhouse, really spearheaded that whole movement to try and get that county library law in place. Uh, she was the university library librarian at the University of what is now the University of Montana in Missoula. She was a Montana Library Association leader. And she thought it was very important that a law give Montana counties the authority to apply for Carnegie funds for the first time. Dedicated to the county library's program's success and its potential to reach rural Montanans, Buckhouse sometimes intervened with Bertram, including in Bighorn County, about the sink. 
on the applicant's behalf. Bertram respected her professional expertise and not only welcomed but also sought out her opinions and explanations. The flurry of settlement and construction that defined much of Montana history through the 20th century came to a quick end by the, at the turn of the 20th century, excuse me, came to a quick end by the late 1910s. Widespread drought began in 1917 and placed an enormous strain on the agricultural economy. After World War I ended in 1918, speculative banking practices and the downturn of extractive industries such as logging and mining further contributed to the economic crisis in Montana during the 1920s. Montana was the only state to lose population between 1920 and 1930. Dependent on tax revenues, the many local libraries struggled to stay fiscally sound through the 1930s. But despite these challenges, and often with the steady support of local women's clubs, all 17 Carnegie libraries remained open and steadily increased their collections and their outreach efforts. And this is in large part, not only the women's clubs, but the actual librarians. Um, the woman who was the librarian, and I want to get it right, I think it was in Chinook, took a 70%, something like that, pay cut in order to keep the library open. She was paid something like a buck 70 a month or something like that, and she lived in the basement of the building just to keep it open for her patrons. Despite the challenges and often with the steady support of women's clubs, they stayed open. Their services included branch libraries, rural delivery, and special children's programming. During the Great Depression, local public libraries functioned as information hubs where farmers could learn about new agricultural methods and techniques. They also served and continue to serve as community gathering places. The Fort Benton Women's Club, for example, has met monthly in the basement of the Carnegie Library for more than a century. And another fun. The Big Timber Women's Club also has been in the basement, well, they get out after the meetings, but they've been meeting in the basement of the Big Timber Library for a long time, um, ever since it was opened. And I'm going to tell a funny story. <laughs> it's a good story. So we were there in Big Timber when we kicked off the book, and um, the librarian there told a story of the mayor of Big Timber came to her and said, you know, we'd like to hold our city council meetings in the basement of the library from now on because it's a nicer space. Um, and we have them on, whatever, Tuesday nights. And uh, could you please ask the women's club if they'd be willing to move their meeting? And so the librarian, she was very nervous. And she, she's like, I didn't want to face them. So I just left them a note on the whiteboard saying, the mayor asks. <laughs> And, of course, the note the next morning back on the whiteboard was, you may tell the mayor that he can change the time of his meeting. Oh. And he did. So they, exactly, no interloper man is going to come in and tell them what to do. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, for rural patrons, the arrival of a book truck or an excursion to the library in town offered respite from troubled times and the opportunity to connect with others. But Montana's library's fortunes improved along with the rest of the economy following World War II. In 1949, the Library Association successfully petitioned the le legislature to fund the Montana State Library C Commission. Um, the commission and its team of professional librarians supported local libraries by learning books, providing field visits and trainings, and responding to librarians' inquiries for help and advice. Still, by 1954, approximately one-fourth of Montana's population lacked access to library services. That year, the legislature authorized a state library extension commission dedicating to founding new libraries quote, improving established libraries and aiding in the establishment of traveling libraries. In Montana, the Extension Commission administered programs funded in part by the National Library Services Act of 1956, a landmark piece of legislation that offered funding for collections, staff, equipment, and interlibrary loans, and for Brooklyn Bill programs. It also supported the development of library federations, multi-county cooperative organizations that allowed libraries to share resources. Pictured here is the Five Valleys Bookmobile. I love that one. 
The Missoula Public Library was a leader in traveling library programs and even loaded boxcars full of books to be used at logging camps. And this photo is one of those boxcars. Um, the photo dates to 1926. So they'd load up the boxcar and the tables and they would take it out onto the branch line um, and they'd leave it there for a week or two, collect all the books back, and then kind of do a roundabout and, and, and trade out all the books so that they had a fresh selection every, every few weeks or every month or so. <clears throat> Whereas the Library Services Act significantly helped advance Montana's library programming, the 1964 Library Services and Construction Act stimulated the physical transformation of many of the state's libraries, including those originally constructed with Carnegie support. The federal program provided matching funds to material increase and improve libraries' capacity to serve. Um, poor Miles City. I, uh, it was so beautiful. And they chose, when they got this new funding from the federal government, to put an addition onto their library, which you know a lot of libraries did. But they put it right on the front. Um, so if you are driving down Main Street, and you see the courthouse in Main Street in Miles City, library sitting right next to it, and you might not recognize it as the Carnegie right away because it's right, uh, the addition goes right up to the sidewalk and kind of envelops it uh, all along the corner, around the corner. Um, so, Tom, I don't know how you did it, but Tom Ferris managed to take gorgeous photographs of all of the architectural details that still remain on this uh, library. And, you know, the interior space is great. They needed the space. It was a small lot. Okay. Um, but did they really have to rip a gaping hole in the front? So there really is very little left of the original front of the Miles City Library. They're very nice people, but there's a big hole. Um, but if you go up a set of stairs, right kind of where the addition meets the original building and go upstairs, there's this wonderful space called the Montana Room that has the original bookshelves, a lot of the original furnishings, the windows are there. You can see out those arched windows on the sides. Um, and it is really quite lovely. So if you just close your eyes until you get up there, <laughs> you can enjoy it. Uh, what year was that? Um, 1965, they did that. Um, the same year, at least they kept their standing, because in the same year, Glasgow and Great Falls both demolished their Carnegie libraries and constructed new facilities. Um, you know, and I like the Great Falls Public Library. I think it's kind of cool, new formalist, you know. I don't hate bad architect uh, new architecture. I hate bad new architecture. That's a good new, big new architecture. Um, but they did end up tearing down the Great Falls Library. By 1981, Kalispell, Missoula, Malta, Chinook, and Bozeman had abandoned their Carnegies for new accommodations. The remaining eight Carnegie libraries underwent upgrades, expanding collections and programming, improving accessibility, building additions, and accommodating new technologies. Many of these changes were respectful of the building's original designs and preserved their historic and architectural integrity. So that's where we are. And now because we're in Helena, I often get the question, did Helena have a Carnegie Library? And if not, why? And it's typical Helena story. <laughs> so even though there is no Carnegie Library in Helena, I thought I'd just give you a quick rundown of what was going on here. The town's first library was a collection of books gathered and donated by city's the city's residents. In 1868, a subscription library opened in the Whitlatch Building at the northeast corner of Jackson and Broadway, one of the first public libraries, if not the first, um, though not free, it was not a free library, uh, in Montana. Fortunately, it moved from the Whitlatch to a commercial building on South Main above Wall Street, so it was spared from the fire of August 1872. Unfortunately, Fire struck the library building and much of the downtown in January 9th, 1874, destroying the library. And so this is a picture of right before the, the fire struck. Um, so this is essentially what is now Last Chance Gulch. It was soon reestablished, and in 1866, the citizens passed a municipal levy of one half mil 
by the resounding vote of 538 to 16 to establish a free Helena Public Library. The free library opened in the Murphy Block on August 7, 1886, and it moved in 1892 here to an elegant new home in the annex of the City Auditorium on 7th Avenue. This architectural gem once stood at 7th and Warren, east of the current 7th Avenue gym, which is the only historic building left on that block. Photos of the library's reading room show it was graced with tall ceilings, large windows, and chandeliers. Quote, at the library can now be found the latest files of every newspaper in the state, proclaimed an 1894 article. Quote, the public library, though it is poorly heated during extreme cold weather, is crowded by people every day and night, reports another February 1895 article. And it grows in popularity every year. By 1907, though, the library's 44,000 item collection filled the space and the city applied to Carnegie for funds to build an independent library building. Bertram responded with an offer for $30,000. But several influential members of the community had a much bigger gift in mind. Um, they wanted another big building like the auditorium building with a gymnasium and big community center and a library and they wanted Carnegie to pay for all of it. Senator Thomas Carter sought to intervene with Carnegie and explain the need for more money. He and other wealthy Hellenans envisioned a big multi-use building to be located at 6th and Ewing on a site donated by the Larson family. Um, so that's the intersection where the original governor's mansion is. Um, and they wanted to go back to Carnegie and ask for more money. They estimated their needs at $75,000 or even $100,000. The city even went so far as to tear down one of the oldest buildings in the city uh, on that corner to make room for their grand expedition. Uh, debate raged back and forth, and in the end, the city voted to reject Carnegie's offer because the city's plans remained in conflict with Carnegie's rules about his funds about a freestanding library. There was also an awful lot of jealousy with Great Falls that got $50,000 for their library, but of course they had a bigger population. It was all based on population. They had a formula, um, but there were several letters going, but Great Falls got 50,000 and we're so much, we're the capital for crying out loud. So yeah, Bertram was not happy. Um, and in the end they rejected the money and so that's why we didn't get a Carnegie library in Helena. <clears throat> so instead the library stayed put until 1933 when it moved to the former Unitarian Church, you guys know this building, at uh, Lawrence and Park, what is Grand Street Theater today? It remained there until 1976, when an urban renewal afforded the opportunity to, con to construct the new building where it is right now. So that's the story of, the quick and dirty story of Helena Library. But getting back, oh, here's the interior of when it was at Grand Street. Still a little crowded. So getting back to those communities their Carnegie libraries were built, women's clubs, librarians, community leaders, donors, voters, builders, and architects worked together to construct 17 Carnegie libraries across Montana between 1902 and 1922. Librarians worked and continue to work to serve their communities as critical sources of information. And one librarian wrote on the occasion of the retirement of a longstanding uh, librarian at Blaine County, she wrote this poem, and I'm going to read this poem. It's called The Librarian's Lament. They asked for a book, the name quite absurd, the queerest title you've ever heard. One word of the title they seem to recall, the rest of the name they don't know at all. The book they say they think is read. It's about this big by a man who's dead. They don't know the author, they don't know the name, but insist on having the book just the same. <laughs> so today, Montana's 15 surviving Carnegie libraries represent the long-term commitment to education, social improvement, civic responsibility of its early citizens. Nine of Montana's Carnegie libraries continue to serve their communities as public libraries. Three provide an alternative cultural experience as art venues. Two contribute to their locality by providing office space, while one, Sweet Malta, awaits rehabilitation. I love Malta. Which one's Malta? Where's Malta? Oh, up, up here. Malta is a great town. If any of you would like to move to Malta, 
It's fabulous. There's tons to do there. And it's got this wonderful building that just needs a roof. And if it just had a roof, the water damage would stop and we'd be able to save the Malta Carnegie Library. And um, it was the museum, the local museum, for quite a few years. They moved into a historic house uh, in another part of town and left it. Um, and so it was owned by the city and it was up for auction and it might have been demolished and a young couple we're driving through town, as people are wont to do, you know, it's a destination. And they stopped and they saw it was for sale and they bought it because they didn't want to see it destroyed. And so, you know, they're not wealthy people, but they really, really have a commitment to this. And so they're trying to get money to stabilize it. They would love it for, be, for it to be a community center. They would love for, you know, somebody with, that does have the money to fix the roof to come in and, and work with them to, to save it. So. If you you know, want to do something different with your life, may I suggest embracing the Malta Carnegie Library. It's so great. But all of these stand as cultural and architectural reminders that local history is connected to statewide and national events, programs, and trends, while also reflecting their community's identity and our common heritage. And that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you.